In our talk about the humeral shaft fractures, we will start with an introduction. So, humeral shaft fractures are common fractures. They account for up to 5% of all fractures in adult patients, and they affect the diaphysis of the humerus bone. So they affect the diaphysis of the humerus bone, as you can see in this picture, and they might be associated with radial nerve injury. And humeral shaft fractures have a bimodal distribution in older women due to low energy falls and in young men as a result of high energy injuries. And they are mostly treated non-operatively and they heal in around 9 weeks. Moving on to talk about the mechanism of injury. So humeral shaft fractures are caused by low energy trauma which is the most common mechanism for these fractures and this occurs due to a fall on the hand or elbow or a direct blow to the arm. And these injuries could be also caused by a high energy trauma such as in road traffic accidents or crash injuries. And they also could be caused by a pathology in the humeral shaft leading to the fracture. For example, metastasis of the humeral shaft. Now let's talk about the classification of these fractures. So the humeral shaft fractures are classified according to the AO classification of diaphyseal fractures. And they are classified into three groups, A, B, and C. In group A, we have the symbol two fragment fractures. In group B, we have the wedge fractures, which are also the butterfly fractures. And in group C, we have the complex fractures. So in group A, we have the symbol two fragment fractures, such as in these examples. So in the first picture, we have the spiral humeral shaft fracture. In the second picture, we have the oblique humeral shaft fracture. And in the third picture, we have the transverse humeral shaft fracture. Now, group B is for the wedge fractures, which are the butterfly fractures. And in these fractures, there is some contact between the two main fragments. Now, in the wedge fractures, we have more than two fragments. So in this example, we have one, two, and three. And in group B, also there is some contact between the two main fragments. So there's some contact between this fragment and this fragment, which are the main fragments. So here we have some contact between them. And the first example here is for the butterfly fracture. And the second example is for the multi-fragment butterfly fracture. And in group C, we have the complex fractures. So in these fractures, there is no contact between the two main fragments. So as you can see in this example, we have one, two, and three fragments, and there is no contact whatsoever between the two main fragments. And in the first example here, we have the segmental fracture. And in the second example, we have the irregular fracture and both of those are in group C. And it is important to draw your attention to a special type of fracture, it's called the Holstein-Lewis fracture. So this is an oblique fracture at the junction of the middle and distal thirds of the humerus. So as you can see in this picture here, this is the Holstein-Lewis fracture. It's an oblique fracture between the junction of the middle and distal thirds of the humerus and it is important to know because this fracture is commonly associated with radial nerve injury in 22% of the cases and the radial nerve injury occur in 10% in other types of the humeral shaft fractures so 22% for the Holstein loss fracture and 10% for the other types of fractures now regarding the pathological anatomy 
in these fractures. So if the fracture was above the deltoid insertion, so if the fracture was above the deltoid tuberosity in the humerus, the proximal fragment will be adducted by the pectoralis major muscle in most of the cases. So as you can see in this picture here, we have an anterior view of the humerus showing the muscular insertion and we have the deltoid muscle inserting here into the deltoid tuberosity. So if the fracture was above the deltoid insertion, so if it was here, let's say, the proximal fragment, which is this fragment, will be adducted by the pectoralis major muscle, which is inserting here. But if the fracture was below the deltoid insertion, then the proximal fragment is abducted by the deltoid in most of the cases. If the fracture was below the deltoid insertion here, so let's say if it was here, then the proximal fragment would be abducted by the deltoid action. And shortening type of displacement is common in these fractures due to the muscle pull on the distal fragment. So because the muscle are pulling on the distal fragments, this will lead to shortening displacement and is common with these fractures. Now let's talk about the clinical features. So the patient present supporting their injured arm with the other one and complaining of pain. So the patient will present supporting their injured arm with the other one and complaining of pain. And there might be swelling and some shortening of the patient arm and the bruising may not be seen initially in the presentation, but it will develop after. And during reduction of the fracture, crevitas may be heard. And it is very important to test for radial nerve function before and after treatment by assessing the active extension of the metacarbophalangeal joints. So you assess for radial nerve function by asking the patient to extend their metacarbophalangeal joints. So you ask them to do this movement to make sure that their radial nerve is intact. And you send the patient for the usual trauma labs and imaging investigations, and you also send them for anterior posterior and lateral humerus X-rays radiographs. And those are enough to make the diagnosis, and they will show the fracture line and any displacement is seen well. For example, here we have a lateral humerus X-rays showing a spiral fracture in the distal third of the humerus bone. Moving on to talk about the treatment. So humerus shaft fractures are treated non-operatively in 90% of the cases and operatively in 10% of the cases. Regarding the non-operative treatment, so non-operative treatment is done in 90% of the humeral shaft fractures and they would heal in around nine weeks. And these fractures don't need perfect reduction nor perfect immobilization because the weight of the arm is enough to pull the fragments into alignment. And non-operative treatment is done through a cooptation splint which applied for nine days and then replaced with a functional brace, which is the Sarmento brace for the humerus. And the Sarmento brace is worn for the rest of the time after. So the cooptation splint is done initially in the emergency department and it is used to stabilize the fracture for the first nine days. And then it would be replaced with the Sarmento brace after, as we mentioned. And I don't have pictures for the Sarmento brace or the cooptation splint, so it is better to Google them just to see how they look. Now, previously, a hanging cast was used to treat these injuries, but nowadays it is used is diminished due to it being heavy and can't be adjusted when the swelling subsides, unlike the functional brace, which can be adjusted and it is very light. In this picture, you can see the hanging cast, which was previously used. 
And it is very important to advise the patient to exercise their wrist and fingers from the start. And the pendulum exercises of the shoulder are begun within a week, but the active abduction is avoided until the fracture is united, which is in around nine weeks. Now regarding the operative treatment of the humerus shaft fractures, so the great majority of these injuries unite with non-operative treatment and there is no good evidence that the union rate is higher with operative treatment. That is due to many reasons, for example, due to the destruction that comes with nailing or the periosteal stripping that comes with the plating. And the complication rate after operative treatment of the humerus is high. So the operative treatment is not the best option, but there is clear indications for the operative treatment. So indications of operative treatment include severe displacement if more than 30 degrees of angulation or more than 3 centimeters of shortening or more than 15 degrees of rotation. Those all are indications of operative treatment. Indications also include this vascular limp or expanding hematoma, meaning there is injury to the brachial artery. So in this case, operative treatment is indicated. Operative treatment is also indicated in open fractures, in segmental or intra-articular fractures, in multiple trauma. So if the patient have trauma in other parts of the body and operative treatment also indicated when there is a floating elbow. So if there is a humeral shaft fracture and a forearm fracture at the same time, this would lead to the floating elbow, which is an indication for operative treatment. Pathological fracture, also indications for, of operative treatment because it would refracture again, so it has to be fixated and non-union is an indication of surgery. And finally, the patient choice. So if the patient feel the fracture fragment moving in the splint, which is distressing to them, this lead to the patient choosing to do surgery to treat the fracture. And the operative treatment is achieved either by open reduction internal fixation with a compression plate and screws, which is the most common type of method used to treat these fractures operatively, or those fractures can be treated with open reduction, internal fixation with an interlocking intramedullary nail. And the other option is external fixation. Now let's talk about the complications that come with the humerus shaft fractures. So complications include the brachial artery injury. So the brachial artery injury is an early complication and the brachial artery might be damaged in these injuries. And the most common manifestation of the brachial artery injury is an expanding hematoma. And rarely there will be signs of vascular insufficiency to the limb due to rich collateral circulation that supplies the limb. And the signs of vascular insufficiency include absence of distal pulses, so absence of the radial pulse and the ulnar pulse, and the pale limb and the slow re capillary refill time. And this complication is an emergency requiring exploration and direct repair of the artery or grafting if needed. Complications also include the radial nerve palsy, and this is also an early complication. It occur in 10% of the cases, and the radial nerve palsy manifests as wrist drop and paralysis of the metacarbophalangeal extensors. So the patient would be present with wrist drop, and this complication occur more with the oblique fractures at the junction of the middle and distal thirds, which we already talked about, it is the Holstein Lewis fracture. And the percentage of the radial nerve injury in the Holstein Lewis fractures is 22%, while it is only 10% for the other fracture types. And in closed injuries of the humerus, the radial nerve mostly sustain neurobraxia type of injury, 
and it will recover afterwards, so it is not an indication for surgery. But if the radial nerve function was intact before manipulation, but got defective afterwards, so if we checked the radial nerve function and we found out that it is working fine, but after we do the treatment and we recheck it again, we find that the radial nerve is not intact anymore. Or if the same happens after surgery, so if we check the radial nerve function before surgery and it is working, but after surgery it's not, this means that the nerve was torn during the procedure. So it is either torn during manipulation or torn during surgery and surgical exploration is necessary to treat the nerve. And the wrist and hand must be regularly exercised passively to preserve the joint function until the nerve recovers. And if the radial nerve function not recovered by 12 weeks, then surgical exploration to treat the nerve should be done. Another complication is compartment syndrome. This is also an early complication. And compartment syndrome is muscle swelling within a facial compartment in the arm due to the damage to these muscles caused by the trauma. And this complication is precipitated by a tight cast applied in the emergency department. And this complication requires emergency fasciotomy surgery to be treated. And compartment syndrome is very dangerous. The patient could lose their limp if it was not detected. So it needs high index of suspicion from the physicians. Another complication is delayed union. So transverse fractures are the most common to have delayed union. And they sometimes take months to unite. And as long as there is callus formation, it is worth waiting. Meanwhile, shoulder exercises should be done to prevent stiffness from occurring. Another complication is non-union. That is when the fracture doesn't unite. And the rate of non-union in low energy humeral shaft fractures treated non-operatively is 3%, while it is much more in high energy segmental fractures and open fractures. And the rate of non-union in intramedullary nailing is around 10%. It is higher because in intramedullary nailing, there is distraction of the fracture, which leads to delayed union and non-union. And if the elbow or shoulder movements is forced before the consolidation of the fracture, or if the intramedullary nail is removed too early, this may lead to refracturing, and then non-union is more likely. And treatment of non-union is operative. The bone ends are freshened and the cancellous bone graft is packed around them and the reduction is held with an intramedullary nail or a compression plate. And finally, we have the complication of joint stiffness. This is a common complication and it can be minimized by early activity. And with that, we reach the end of this video. Thank you guys for watching. Please give us a like and comment your ideas and questions. And this video is a part of a bigger class. It is called the Shoulder and Arm Trauma Masterclass. You can check it out if you want.